You're listening to Latin Waves with your hosts, Sylvia and Stuart Richardson. Latin Waves is more than just hot rhythms. This is a show about community, about creating a culture that is inclusive and based on fairness. Because everyone deserves dignity, respect, and has something to contribute. A new world is possible, and it all starts with us. You are listening to Latin Waves, and we are very privileged this morning to be speaking with Dr. Robin Hanel. He is the author of Participatory Economy of the People by the People, The Case for a Participatory Economy. He's also co-author of the book Alternatives to Capitalism. Thank you for being on our program. Now, we have on the left been you know, waging battles against injustice for decades, for centuries, I would argue. There's, as far as we can look back, there's been uprisings of people feeling disadvantaged, feeling disempowered by structures, whether um, they were feudalism or capitalism. There's always been something that is expropriating the work that we co-create as workers and putting it in the hands of a few. So what are the lessons um, that we need to take heart, you know, over the last five decades that we have been you know, in a modern uh, struggle, I suppose, against this neoliberalism now exacerbates that injustice? I mean, if you, t- if you take the very long view, capitalism was an improvement over feudalism. The elimination of slavery was a huge achievement. Um, in non if you take a look at the last 40 years, well, if you, t- if you take a look at the middle of the 20th century, um, the reform of robber-bearing capitalism into social democratic capitalism with unions, social security, Medicare, was a huge improvement, you know, in terms of of how well the economy was serving the interests of the vast majority. Um, We made a lot of economic progress in the middle of the 20th century um, in terms of reforming capitalism. Over the past 40 years, we have mostly gone backwards in, t- in terms of our, our battles to make the economy more democratic, more fair. In other areas, I think it's important to realize we haven't. Um, if, you, if you ask about, well, what's happened about gender inequality over the same 40 years, I think we've made tremendous strides in the right direction. Um, In many ways, we have also made tremendous strides in terms of combating the evils of racism. So in some areas, humanity has progressed over the past 40 years, but it's it's important for us to realize that in terms of the economy, we have been on a, for the past four decades, we have been headed in the wrong direction. We are desperately searching for ways to turn those struggles around, and that's what it's really all about at the moment. We want to continue to make progress in terms of gender equality and racial equality, and we need to turn and we need to reverse the trend as far as what has been happening in the economy. You know, I was thinking about um, a recent book I was re- uh, reading about the Anthropocene era. You know, this idea that there's been so many ecological destructive moments in the history of Earth, and that now the one that is approaching is one being co created by human activity. And so the, they're giving it the name of Anthropocene. But in the book, they talk about anacro capitalism, this capitalism of death, where you know the increased amount of death increases the wealth of certain people. So, how do we connect the immediacy to attend to nature, to um, the devastation that has been co-created by exploitation, plundering of oil resources, and you know? fracking and all these monocultures that have created terrible, disastrous effects on the land, on the water, on the food that we consume? The the economic struggles that we engage in, I think there's a huge difference in the 21st century than there were in centuries past. In centuries past, if we failed, then we simply failed to promote 
greater economic justice. We failed to promote greater economic democracy. We basically failed to reform or transform economies to better serve human humanity. If we fail in the 21st century, if we fail in the century that's coming, then we run the risk of damaging nature to the point that we will trigger cataclysmic climate change that is irreversible. People need to take that information from climate scientists seriously. A lot of people do. A lot of people do understand that we are running an incredible risk. If we don't dramatically change the trajectory of carbon emission in the next two decades, we are running a risk that nobody, that no sane person should ever be willing to undertake. That's a dimension that we have never had to deal with before. We have to reduce carbon emissions by 80% before the middle of this century. We, are we running a risk that, that humanity can't afford to run? Well, fortunately, there's no reason we can't do that. Fortunately, we can even do that without replacing capitalism. But it means politically defeating the power of the fossil fuel industries and the politicians and political parties that serve their interests. We actually have to do it. Um, now, the other good news is that we can do that. We can transform our economies to be energy efficient and rely on renewables rather than fossil fuels. And in the process of doing that, we can create full employment with all the jobs that are going to be required to do this great transformation. And we can do it, and those jobs can be jobs that pay decent wages if we fight for them to be unionized jobs or jobs that pay decent wages. So I do believe that the coming generation, in some sense, faces a task that is – it's greater than any task we've ever – that humanity has ever faced because we finally have gotten to the point where if we do not accomplish this, we really are going to despoil the planet to the point where it is unlivable. You know, one of the things that I'm always amazed by is how many of our tools have been taken against us, right? So we look at the news and we hear a lot about the president, Donald Trump, is now renegotiating NAFTA and there's a new TTP agreement and there's all these agreements, but they never tell the people what what is at the table? We hear in Canada, oh, Canada's doing very good at the table. What table? What is being discussed? What is being negotiated? And I think here's the part where we as citizens need to become more engaged, more curious. Because as you said, this is no longer just about creating a better voting system, a more politically engaging, uh, diverse society. This is not just about our gender rights rights and equality of presentation and representation in the political arena. This is about survival. It's about survival. Fortunately, there is a, there, there is a policy alternative that is both feasible, will be, can be successful. It, it, it's called the Green New Deal. Um, people such as Bob Poland at the Political Economy Research Institute, University of Massachusetts, have done tremendous work. He's not the only one. Um, but we now know that we can have full employment and we can transform our energy system, our transportation system, so that it is environmentally sustainable by the middle of the next century, by the middle of the present century. The scientists and the engineers know how to run modern productive economies without burning fossil fuels that destroys the environment. We don't need to wait for a new invention. And we also don't need to do something incredibly dangerous, which is to rely on nuclear power. All of this is increasingly obvious and feasible. It is entirely a matter of overcoming political obstacles embracing the transformation the way that the Western world embraced preparing our economies to win the war against fascism in World War II. 
we need to have a mobilization of that magnitude. And it will have the consequences that that did, which was it was a full employment economy to produce the war materials necessary to defeat fascism. We need a full employment economy to transform our energy and transportation systems um, so that we are no longer destroying the natural environment by the middle of this century. I, I think it's important that we progressives learn to sort of describe what we are doing in terms of that is the march that we are urging people to join us on. Um, and if we do that, I think that we can be successful. There's no reason we can't be. If you take a look at what that requires, that is going to require an awful lot of planning. That's going to require an awful lot of coordination amongst different countries on the planet. I think a successful Green Deal, Green New Deal, will establish confidence, human confidence, in the fact that we can actually plan for the major necessities of what we have to accomplish as humanity. And I think that also takes us in the direction of realizing we don't need private enterprise, we don't need markets. We, we accomplish the great things through democratic planning and coordinating our activities in a cooperative way. So I think that it also helps us in a transition to a new kind of economy and a new kind of society. I, I think that not only do we have the technology, do we, not only do we have excess of wealth that can you know, make this happen, um, there's also a responsibility. You know, I was um, reading the news that uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, they're looking at day zero. And day zero is talking about the day they will run out of water. Now, what can be more urgent than protecting our water resources from the poisoning of fracking, from the spills of massive oil, you know, spills? Because there is being now open gates to, you know, drilling on the coast, protecting the, the ocean waters. What can be more urgent than, you know, safeguarding that we have the essentials for life, which is water, air, soil, so we can grow food? So to me, this not only makes perfect economic sense, you know, we often separate the economy from the environment, we separate the economy from the, the justice component of living life that enables every human being to have access to proper health and proper housing. So to me, they're, they're, they're together, they're one. So can we talk about this um, New Deal and what does it require from the average citizens? Because we all have power to do something. We all have power to collectively come together and create new ways of being, new ways of seeing, new ways of envisioning, uh, not, you know, utopias, but a real utopia in this here and now. Anything, anything that, that increases the use of fossil fuels is literally signing a death warrant. The environmental movement understands that. The Obama administration did not retard the you know, the, the evolution of neoliberalism. But the Obama administration did close off every area of coastal area around the United States, including Alaska, to, to further exploration of pumping oil out of the ground that must be kept in the ground from under the seas. The Trump administration has now opened up all coastal areas in the United States, until he noticed that, oh, that meant Florida, and that's where Mar-a-Lago is, and that's a critical state in the 2020 election. It's a battleground state. So in a blatantly obvious, I mean, nothing could be more obvious. The fossil fuel industries, you know, Trump is serving the fossil fuel industries of opening up all these areas, and except for Florida, and it's so clear why he's exempting Florida. The governor of Oregon is screaming mad. How can you possibly open up our pristine coast 
to oil exploration that we don't need because it's going to destroy the planet. And then you have the chutzpah to say that your state of Florida, where you have Mar-a-Lago, isn't going to be subjected to that. So, yes, I mean, these are, this, is, this is the reality we're living in. We have a desperate fight against the fossil fuel industries and their Trump enablers, and we have to be more. We have to be successful. I mean, in Oregon, we're looking like we're going to be successful in some ways. In California, they are. Um, but the Trump election was a huge setback, and it was a tr- it was a huge setback in terms of the international cooperation. The largest economy on the planet the planet that consumes more fossil fuels than any other. We are the only, the United States is the only country that is not participating in the global effort to do something about climate change. There is no other country that's not still a member of that accord. And the United States no longer is. Well, this is a huge setback. And getting Trump out of office and the Republicans out of power in Washington is a desperate thing that we have to accomplish here in the United States, and hopefully we'll make progress in that area under the elections of 2018. Um, yes, Trump has opted out, but I believe California has decided they will unilaterally uh, be part of the agreement. And I, and I think that this is a very important um, lesson for us to learn, that th- Political systems are what they are, you know, and sometimes I think they get co-created and over time, if we're not careful, they take a a direction of their own. And neoliberalism has been for a long time uh, driving the, the political agenda of the United States. So it has nothing to do uh, with who the person in power is. Rather, you have a very oil machine of um, invasion and uh, a lot of processes in place. But also, I think American people are very democratic, very engaged, and I I have hope that people people can co-create uh, different alternatives can find ways to participate, can find ways to create laws against you know um, increasing plundering of the oceans um, and and create roadblocks for these decisions. I, I don't think that we're d- the doom scenario. It's not doom until we give up. I think that that's where that's where I live. I, I think that nothing's ever done until the people give up their ability to use their own power. I just think that the Trump administration um, is dramatically hastening the decline of U.S. power relative to other countries' powers in the world at large. And I frankly think that is not a bad thing. I think that there was a certain inevitability um, over the 21st century that if you look at populations and if you look at economic growth and if you look at sort of growth in education, et cetera, et cetera, that the BRICS um, – we're inevitably going to increase in global power compared to the old power centers on the planet, the U.S. and Europe. In some sense, that was an inevitable and a natural and a a relatively democratic process. I think that Trump is hastening the decline of U.S. power. Certainly, Trump has turned the United States into an international pariah. Um, You can't be the only country that's not participating in global efforts to do something about climate change and not earn the disrespect, you know, of the entire plan for having done so. And in many other ways, um, I think that Trump is hastening the decline of U.S. power. Um, And that in some ways that is not a bad thing. Um, Now, that all depends on whether or not, you know, the Chinese – behave in a more responsible way as a rising global power than the U.S. did in the aftermath of World War II. And there is absolutely no guarantee of that. Um, But in every other respect, um, Trump has turned the United States into a danger on the planet, Um, a danger in terms of nuclear war, a danger in terms of triggering cataclysmic climate change, um, a danger in terms of stirring up Um, strife in places like the Middle East and on the Korean Peninsula, I am very worried about a wag-the-dog scenario when 
as as he comes under greater and greater political pressure, both from the investigation and the unpopularity of his policies, the guy that I mean, he didn't win 50 percent of the people who voted in the last election. He's a minority president. And as he battles for survival and looks for ways to deflect attention from his own political weakness inside the United States, he will see starting a war as something that is in his political, you know, that is in his political interest. So in that way, I think that we we, we now live in a world where that danger has been increased, unfortunately. But in the big sense, I mean, there is no alternative to what we knew from Mother Jones, you know, a century ago. Don't mourn organize. Um, Don't fool yourself into thinking that situations are good when they're not. Don't fool yourself into thinking that, you know, that somehow everything is great when it's not. But we have to organize and we have to be smarter about it and we have to be more successful about it on a lot of different fronts. I think that um, taking, uh, uh, you know, this admonition very seriously is important and like you said you know let's not waste time wishing things were other than they are let's organize let's mobilize let's co-create the democratic systems we want to see in place and let us create the world that we want to live in regardless of who's in power regardless of who got elected and by what means and and Sylvia it's it's not just When people say don't more and organize, what that basically translates into, we have to be more energetic. Each each and every one of us on average has to put a a higher percentage of our time, life, and energy, you know, into these political tasks of organizing. And that is true. But you can't just say try harder. You also have to try smarter. We really do have to learn lessons from the past. We have to learn what has failed us, and we have to abandon those kinds of efforts, and we have to embrace the efforts that are more successful, and we have to be do a good and honest job of assessing what's being successful and assessing what's failing. And right now, in the present context in the United States, one of the failings would be for us to divide our divisions amongst progressives, radicals, people who want system change, people who just want to reform the system we have, we have to minimize those divisions at present to be more successful at ridding the U.S. of Trump and the Republican Party that stands behind him. And perhaps I think that uh, one of the ways to unite efforts is to find campaigns that brings us to uh, to a medium, you know. And I think that the universal basic income could be one of those that where we can see uh, that, you know, something that allows everyone to rise up above. It keeps the system functioning because people will still be able to buy and participate. But it also, I think, it creates a little space for the average person who works three, four jobs to maybe have only one job or, you know, even just uh, half a job and, and still be able to participate and organize and hear from their neighbors, get to know their neighbors. Who are we? You know, get to know each other. So I think that finding uh, tools that unites us, you know, that create more equity, more participation, I think is a really good way. So in parting, uh, what would be your last uh, words and uh, how would you inspire a population? If you were to have one key item to mobilize on, what would that be? I think, I think our overall strategy has to be a Green New Deal. And that's going to require a lot more cooperation between the labor movement and the environmental movement than we've had in the past. Neither one can win without the other. Um, There are people in both movements that understand that. I mean, going back 20 years, there were very few people in either the labor movement who understood they couldn't win without the environmental movement. And there were very few people in the environmental movement that thought they couldn't win, who who realized you can't win without the labor movement. So we've made progress in that area. um, And I think that sort of should be the uniting thing. You pointed out something very true about a universal basic income. 
where there's a a very wide awareness amongst the populace that there are two things that are very, very wrong and dangerously wrong. One is we are headed off the environmental cliff with climate change. And the other is capitalism has never generated escalating inequality of income and wealth at the pace that it has in the past 30 to 40 years. So those are the two big problems that there is popular awareness something must be done about. And universal basic income addresses one. Green New Deal addresses one, if not both. And those are the reasons we have to be thinking about those types of policies. One thing you pointed out about universal basic income, that unions, unions have a very uh, schizophrenic attitude toward UBI. Um, in some ways, they don't like it. And the reason for that is, well, wait a minute. Um, it used to be that everybody who wanted to fight for better wages, working conditions, and economic justice, we all did it through the unions. That's us. Well, now if you're going to be doing this, does that mean nobody's going to care about unions anymore? And that is a serious problem. People should not underestimate the, the, the fact that is this really an abandonment on progressives' part of trying to save unions, strengthen unions, et cetera? Have we given up on them in order to do something else? Well, they're very concerned about that, and they should be. On the other hand, objectively, a UBI would make it easier for unions to fight for higher wages because it essentially sets a reservation wage. People would be less inclined to work for poverty-level wages if they had a universal basic income to fall back on. You'd actually have to offer people a job with decent wages and decent benefits, or else they would say, I don't need that. I'm not going to be in poverty. So in some ways, the universal basic income makes it easier for unions to win fights. On the other hand, I think they reasonably view it as a competition um, over whether progressives are going to be working to help unions or doing less of that because they're doing something else instead. These are the kinds of practical things that we have to be smart about. Thank you so much for being with us. My guest is Robin Hanel. His latest book is Alternative to Capitalism. My most favorite book is his book, The Case for a Participatory Economy. Where can people access your work? Try and get free copies of everything. My students pay for nothing anymore. Clever, clever lads and lassies. Maybe we finally have information that is virtually free. Thank you so much for that. You are a wonderful economist, one of my, <laughs> and one that speaks to my heart. I think a society that is well informed is a society that is stronger for it. Well, thank you again, Sylvia, and I'm sure we'll talk again in the near future. Take care. Thanks again. We've come to the end of our show, Latin Waves. Latin Waves is an internationally syndicated weekly program made available through campus and community stations and available out to the world at www.latinwavesmedia.com. Visit Latin Waves Media to hear previous shows to access resources or support our efforts towards social change via community project engagement. Thank you and bye for now.